All right. So that is the cost approach. Now, here's the problem with the cost approach that we just mentioned is that in some cases, we have to figure depreciation. All right. And depreciation is defined as, uh, let me see where we're at. Depreciation is the loss in value of a property for any reason. And when we calculate depreciation, we use this thing called straight line depreciation. Straight line means that it changes the same that the rise in the run, or they call that the slope, is the same every year, all right? So if we had a property that was valued at $30,000 and it has an economic life of 30 years. Now, time out, side note. This has to do with taxes and calculations and depreciation. It is not truly a loss in value because you will see here in a minute that this theory could be zero and there is no house that actually is worth zero. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing is everything in the world has an economic life according to the IRS. Computers, roofs, houses, roller skates, and it allows you to depreciate this item and the depreciation per year is defined as the dollars over the years. So in this specific case, what is the straight line depreciation of the property? Ten thousand. Exactly. I made easy numbers for everybody. You've got three hundred grand divided by thirty years. That's ten thousand dollars of depreciation per year. So if I ask you, what is the value of the property five years from today, what would you tell me? What is the property's value five years from today? 250,000. Exactly. It would be $250,000. If it depreciated 10,000 a year in five years, it would lose $50,000. Therefore, the value today would be worth $250,000. And it is a and it's straight line, meaning it's the same every year. And it's just the value divided by the economic life of a property. That's how we calculate straight line depreciation. Are we good? Thumbs up, because there are a couple calculations in your homework. All right. Now, that depreciation is a loss in value for any reason. And here are some of the reasons that you can lose value. The first one is called physical deterioration physical deterioration hey the roof just went bad now the good thing about physical deterioration is that it comes in curable and non-curable curable would be like hey the roof's bad we just put a new roof on it we've changed that deterioration a non-curable or uncurable property might be where the value to fix it let me say let me restate that the cost to fix it is greater than the value my wife i've taken my wife downtown several times and she literally cries when we go up College Avenue, because those houses are 6,000, 7,000 square feet that are in such bad shape 
that the cost to fix it is going to be well exceeding what you could sell it for. That would be a case of a non-curable physical deterioration. The cost is greater than the value. Yes, sir. How come banks don't just demo those types of houses? Well, there's a lot of reasons why. The biggest reason is it's not a loss on their books while it's still sitting there. Mm -hmm. They will get to depreciate it on their books. That's one major reason. If they demo it, then it's a loss and they have to write it off on their books. Okay. The other reason is typically, maybe it's free and clear that no one owns it and they just don't want to bother with it because of the cost to fix it. All right. And literally a bank can't take it if they don't have a lien and the guy's not violated the lien. All right. Most of those are private owned, not necessarily bank owned. Shauna? Can we go back once one to the uh, depreciation? Sure. Because I missed something where you asked for five years and was it 240K then or was it 250? And how did we come to that? Because did we take three, 300,000? I hope I wrote 250. Yeah, I think you did. I wrote it down as 250. Am I taking the 300,000 yeah. and dividing that by five? Years? No, what I did was take if it depreciates ten thousand per year, yeah, times five years means it okay. loses fifty thousand dollars. It started okay. at three hundred. It's now fifty five years later worth two hundred and fifty, and that's okay. what I'm seeing when I drew this curve right here. You go up five years, hit that, and go over to that value. If we did ten years. It would be a hundred thousand depreciated, so now it's only worth two hundred k. Got it. All right. Got it. Yeah. Obviously, if you did thirty years, you could see thirty years times ten thousand is three hundred. That's where it crosses that line. It's worth zero. But once again, it's truly not worth zero. Okay. That's the depreciation on it. Thumbs up. There is a, another way a property can depreciate that is called functional obsolescence. Obsolescence is a real big fancy word means that it has fallen out of favor by general concepts. Let me give you an example. One car garage is functionally obsolete. In the 40s and 50s, Wife stayed home, husband went to work, they only needed one car, therefore garages had one, or houses had one car garage. In today's world, people look at a one car garage and go, eh, nah, I'm not interested. You know, my wife's got a car, I've got a car, we need two car. Two bedroom house. Now it's three bedroom. Probably progressed into four bedroom houses. I had a house a number of years ago at 38th and Richard I listed. It was a four bedroom, one bath house. And the guy had three daughters. When we went to list his house, he's like, I said, four bedrooms, one bath. He's like, yeah, when I want to take a crap, I go to Speedway because he couldn't get in the bathroom. That was a functionally obsolete house. Now we sold it, uh, but we probably sold it for way cheaper than a four bedroom, at least two bath house would have been, all right? So functional obsolete obsolescence is when it falls out of favor because of the functionality. One car garage, best example. The last way a property can be ex is externally obsolete. External obsolescence means something outside of the neighborhood or outside of the property, such as the neighborhood. Let me make sure I clarified that again. Something outside of the property, such as the neighborhood, would cause the prop house to be non-desirable. 
you can gold plate the doorknobs at a house at 46th and Post Road. It's still sitting at the murder, murder intersection of Indianapolis. It doesn't matter. That house has a problem due to external obsolescence. It's not the house, it's something external. Yes, sir. So I would say like highways and like prisons, would that be considered those? Yes, the house has a problem. It backs up to the airport. You could put gold plating everywhere. It's still the house that backs up to the airport or the highway, or it's the house next to the prison. Something beyond the owner's control that is causing the problem that will, that, and typically external obsolescence is what is always considered incurable. They are never going to move the prison. They are never going to close the airport. So external obsolescence is almost always deemed incurable. It is a situation, if you think back to when we talk about reverse condemnation, you get the benefits, but you get to suffer the penalty but no benefits like the highway builds right up and you're now, that's an external obsolescence. Your house has lost value for that. Now, one thing I forgot, I wanna make sure I mention it. In the cost approach, in your book, I want you to write homes with no history. Remember in the sales comparison approach, I told you to write homes with a history that we can check. The cost approach, back to what Christina had mentioned, is used for homes with no history or new build homes with no history or limited history they are not they, so you would use this method christina on properties where like such as your parents where the principle of substitution doesn't work i can't find a 4000 square foot house in the country out there within 5 miles so i'm going to have to use a second method that's what this method's designed for now the third method is described as the income method. In your books, write investment property. Investment property. You would use this method to determine value if it was, say, an investment piece of parcel because the value is determined based upon the income that it generates. Now, the next thing we have to talk about is this accounting formula that I want to go over before we get into the in, uh, income so that we can understand what's going on. This is a general concept of accounting that we will need to understand to determine these values. And once again, this is why I said that these guys are often seen as the smartest group because they have to understand some of this. This is a general concept that we will use in this chapter and actually in the next chapter. So the first thing is, I wanna talk about this thing called gross operating income. You will hear it called the GOI. The gross means total operating income. This is where all different kinds of income could come from this. So think of all your income properties and think of the different types of income that would come from this. Now, remember I told you, this is not just residential appraisal. So your gross operating income may include things like rent. That's the most common one that everybody thinks about. 
but there are other sources of income. You may have garage rentals. You may have late fees. You may have a Coke machine that you have on your front porch that generates income. Anything that would generate income would go in here. And we're not just talking about a single family rental. We could be talking about a hundred unit apartment complex. They rent out the clubhouse. There are pool passes. Maybe someone's got a designated parking spot that they pay extra for. Maybe they've got a garage that they pay extra for. There are some apartment complexes. You rent the apartment and for another $20, you get the one with a roof over it. And for another $40, you actually get a garage. So there are all kinds of income that can come about in this gross operating income. From that, we would subtract all of our expenses involved in that rental property. Payroll, marketing, real estate taxes, legal, advertising, all of those would be expenses. You would subtract your expenses from your gross operating income and you get this thing called NOI, net operating income. If you have a J-O-B, which you know what the J-O-B stands for, right? Just over broke. Your J-O-B paycheck looks exactly the same thing. You've got your gross income. Oh, I've got my hourly pay. And then I got time and a half for a uh, vacation and I got triple time for a holiday. And from that gross pay, they are going to subtract all of your expenses. Oh, I got social security income. I've got health insurance. I put money away for a savings plan and you will get your net pay, your net income. From that, you would subtract this really magical, cool word called debt service. Debt service, which most of us more commonly would call a mortgage payment. Now, the key thing to understand here, a mortgage is not an expense. The mortgage payment or the debt service does not get calculated in up here. It is not considered an expense. You opt, you option, you chose to have a mortgage. So from your net income, you would make your debt service payment and the money you have left in your pocket is called cash flow. This accounting principle, like I said, works just like your J-O-B. You get your gross pay, you subtract your expenses, you've got your take-home pay, which is net, you go home to your spouse, you pay your house payment, and the money that's left is your cash flow in your pocket. All right. Now, sometimes you hear them talk about this thing called an effective gross income. Now you got to get really technical. The effective gross income basically is your gross operating income minus some credit loss. Credit loss would be vacancy or people that don't pay. And you will hear investors talk about this. What's your vacancy or what's your effective rent? Well, my, I've got 100% rental of the units rented. Let me say that again so I can say it straight. I've got 100% of my units rented. Somebody goes, oh, so you're making, oh no, five of them aren't paying and I'm getting ready to evict them. So you have a basically 100% occupancy 
but the effective occupancy may only be 80% because you've got credit loss in there. 